One of the enduring images of the First World War is a battlefield landscape scattered with shell craters caused by the huge artillery bombardments which preceded most infantry attacks throughout the war. In this video, I'm going to give you a quick painting guide for these early war miniatures vac formed shell craters, including the reinforced craters. Early war miniatures produce these, and they're perfect to use as scatter terrain and light cover across any First World War tabletop. They can be used for any other period as well, but I mainly use mine in First World War gaming. They are also scaled at 20mm, but I use them for my 15mm games, and they could easily be used for 28mm games as well. But first of all, let's have some history. I'm going to put chapters in the video, so if you don't want to listen to the history, you can skip across to where you need to be. Artillery was one of the most important aspects of the fighting of the First World War, and it developed very quickly throughout the period of 1914 to 1918. At the beginning of the war, artillery was mainly used as a support weapon for troops, but it had to be controlled by forward observation officers directing the guns onto targets so that they could physically see. Map firing was in its infancy, largely due to the inaccuracy of the maps and the way in which artillery was used. Large calibre siege guns were first used by the Germans as they advanced on the Belgian force in 1914 to reduce the defenders' capacity to fight, and these big guns became ever more important as the Western Front settled into a semi-static trench line. In 1915, the overriding use of artillery was as a destructive barrage aimed at the enemy frontline trenches to destroy their lines of defence, which in turn would allow the infantry to attack unmolested. This worked in some places, but was largely due to the number of tubes that could be pointed at the enemy, such as at Orbit Ridge. Small-scale attacks supported by large numbers of guns led to local successes. However, by 1916, the method was still being used, particularly during the week-long bombardment that preceded the Battle of the Somme. The main difference here was that the number of the guns to length of front didn't match the previous battles, and the firing was too thinly spread. Added to this, shell manufacture was still in its infancy, and many of the shells were duds, failing to explode on impact. Those that did buried deep into the ground before exploding, lessening their impact due to the fuses that were being used. Also, many of the shells fired were shrapnel shells, which were good as anti-personnel weapons against men in the open, but poor against barbed wire and deep trenches. That said, new techniques of artillery bombardment were being tried during the Battle of the Somme, with creeping barrages, the fire of which would advance slowly in front of the advancing soldiers, giving them protection by keeping the enemy's heads down and destroying their trenches. The revolution had begun. On the 14th of July, preceding the Battle of Bazantin Ridge, a hurricane bombardment was fired in the pre-dawn attack. This consisted of a short barrage of fire on an unsuspecting enemy, meaning they would be confused and disorientated when the infantry began their attack. This worked incredibly well and the ridge was very quickly taken. But it is 1917 that we see artillery becoming a science. The 106 fuse helped the improvements in artillery. The 106 was a grazed fuse, meaning that it would explode the shell immediately on contact with the ground. This meant that there was less cratering, but more high explosive effect from the fire. Not only did the shells improve, but spotting and registering of targets improved as well. Using aerial photographs and accurate mapping, enemy artillery batteries could be located and fired on. Aircraft flying observation missions with rudimentary wirelesses were able to observe the fall of shot and call in the fire more accurately. Also, new techniques were being developed, such as flash spotting, that is, taking note of enemy batteries from the muzzle flash on their guns, and sound ranging, which was a technique of triangulating the enemy battery positions by tracking the sound of the guns as they fired. These developments allowed the forward observation officer to pinpoint enemy guns and bring down fire to silence them before an attack began. Before the Battle of Cambrai, for example, of the German batteries facing the British attack, about 90% were silenced before zero hour using these techniques. This effectively stopped the German artillery response. Used effectively, artillery could decide the outcome of an attack and even in the War of Movements of 1918, it was still being used prior to operations to support attacking infantry. So there is little wonder the battlefields of the First World War were covered in shell craters. You can cut the craters out separately to begin with if you want, but it is easier to handle them if you keep the sheets intact in the first instance. Doing this, I sprayed the crater sheets with burnt umber spray. You could do this with a brush, but a rattle can is faster. Just ensure you have adequate ventilation or wear a mask. 
It doesn't take long for the spray to dry, but to be sure to give it two coats and leave it overnight. You could also spray the rear of the sheets if you wanted, just to improve the durability a little, but I didn't bother. Next, I took a big makeup brush and some form paint by Decor Art and heavily dry brushed the craters. Do this in steps, building up the paint on the edges and adding more until you get to the result you're after. Just wipe off as much as the paint on the brush before you start. Then I go over the craters with another dry brush. This time it's Stone Grey by Vallejo. This is a nice light colour which brings out the highest rays highlights. A mud, when dried, goes a greenish grey colour anyway. You should do this with a small amount of paint on the brush. Again, as you don't want to block out the previous colours with this layer. Then I turn my attention to the reinforced craters. These have got sandbags and other aspects of defence placed on them. I painted the sandbags in a brown violet by Vallejo, as this matches British sandbag colours quite well. But use whatever colour you think is right. I use a medium sized brush and did this quickly. The detail on the piece is quite nice and easy to follow. On one of the shell craters is a line of corrugated iron used for revetting the entrance to the crater. I painted this in oily steel by Vallejo. I then washed it in Flory Wash Rust. This is a clay wash and although it goes on very bright it actually dries to a great rusty colour. The next step is to give the sandbags a dry brush with fawn to make it slightly lighter. I just go over all the bags in this mix, once again just hitting the highlights and picking out any details. This also gives the impression of the bags being a bit dirty and blended in with the surrounding mud. Once the flurry wash rust has dried I go over everything with Citadel's Agrax Earthshade. Just make sure you completely cover the bags and the corrugated iron and then leave it to dry for a while. Once the wash is dried, I once again go over the sandbags with another dry brush of the base colour of brown violet, just to brighten them up slightly. I then finally seal the paint in place with a spray of Windsor & Newton's Professionals Artist Matte Spray. This will help protect them from the rigours of tabletop gaming. When the varnish is dried I begin the final step. This is to add dirty water to the bottom of the craters. I use Vallejo's Water Effects Poured Resin and mix it in a plastic cup with Vallejo Airbrush Hemp Paints. You can use whatever colour you like, but this looks like a good muddy watercolour to me. I then carefully pour a thin layer of the resin into the base of each crater. Doing this in thin layers will stop the resin shrinking and cracking. If you want it deeper, repeat the process once this layer is dried. This is usually overnight or longer. Then, when the resin has dried, I cut out each crater using a pair of scissors. For this you could use a sharp knife as the plastic is quite thin on the base, but I found scissors to be easy and quick. You'll see that some of the paint flakes off the edge of the cut, so be careful that not too much comes off. I repair this by painting burnt umber around the edge of the individual craters. This will cover any white from the plastic as well. As I said, you can cut the craters at the start of the painting to avoid this, but keeping on the plastic sheets just makes it easier to paint, and this stage only takes a few minutes anyway. And there you have it, an instant crater field for your first world war gaming needs. The early war miniatures craters are a great product, both being cheap and very useful for any game set in the 20th century. Well I hope you've enjoyed this video, if so please do hit that subscribe button and check out my Patreon and channel memberships if you want to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.